If you knew me in high school, you might have known me as this kid that was always jumping on the back of alligators or jumping out of airplanes. I mean, this is a picture of me when I was a senior in high school. And the only reason I show you this one is because it's the least embarrassing one I could find. If you knew me outside of school when I was a student, you would have known me as this kid that was passionate and full of life and energy and just wanted the next big adventure. But if you knew me in school, so if you were my teacher, you saw a completely different version of me. You either saw this kid that was just constantly getting on your nerves and getting into trouble because he was bored, or you knew this kid that was just absolutely bored but didn't want to get in trouble and so did very little to contribute to what was going on in the classroom. I was that kid that just sat there quietly and never raised my hand and never contributed to discussion and never gave anything beyond C-level work. I always did just enough to get by to keep my mom happy, to keep her off my back, just enough so I could get to the next level. The traditional motivators of school were not interesting to me. And they weren't enough to get me to actually engage in my education. I was a C student. Now, this came back to bite me in my senior year of high school when everybody was applying for schools to go away to college. And all of my friends, they were going to Florida State University. And I grew up in Florida and we all heard about FSU. And I was like, oh, this is where I wanna go. I wanna be with my friends. And so I applied to one school. Even though my mom said, Trevor, you need to make sure you have backups. So if you don't get into FSU, you can at least have somewhere else to go. And I said, fine, mom, I'll apply to some backup schools. But I lied to my sweet mother and I only applied to one. And then that day when all of my friends were getting their acceptance letters, mine came in the mail too. And I ripped this thing open and on the front was the logo for Florida State. And I look at it and it says, dear Trevor, we would like to invite you to be on the wait list at Florida State University. And I'm thinking the wait list, that must mean I just have to wait a little bit longer than everybody else before I get in. And so I went to my mom and when she said, so tell me, did you get in? I said, yes, I got in. And I forgot to tell her about the whole wait list thing. But again, I didn't care because I didn't care about school and I could care less about college. The only reason I applied is because of the expectation that I have to do it. Um, and so the whole senior semester went by and I kept the whole waitlist thing to myself. And then when my mom threw me a big congratulations party, I just kind of went along with it. And then when my grandpa, who'd been saving up my entire life, wrote me that check, I just kind of went along with it. Um, I just went with it and then the whole summer went by and finally it was the week before school started. The first like week of school was about to begin the following Monday and all of my friends were moving five and a half hours north to Tallahassee, Florida to go to school and I had a decision to make here. I'm like, what do I do? Because I'm not in. That waitlist status never changed and I'm starting to really sweat here. And so I finally made the rational decision every 18 year old boy would have made in this, this situation. I went up to my sweet mother and I said, mom, I love you. I'll see you at Thanksgiving. And I moved five and a half hours away to go to a college I didn't even get into. And I don't know what to do in this situation. I don't know something about my prefrontal cortex not being fully formed. Didn't make good rational decisions back then. And so I didn't know what to do in this situation. And so the day before school started, the Friday before the Monday of the first semester, I went to the Dean of Education at Florida State and I asked if I could have a meeting with her. And her secretary said, do you have an appointment? And I said, no. And she said, well, then there's no way she's going to be able to meet with you the day before school started. She's in charge of 38,000 students. I'm like, oh, well, do, do you mind if I sit in her lobby and maybe if she has time, she can meet with me? And she said, you're welcome to wait. And so I sat in this lobby for six hours that day until finally the dean comes out of her office and sees this weird kid sitting there. She points at me and says, come in. So I kind of shuffle into her office and I sit down and she says, what can I do for you? I said, ma'am, I've been on the wait list and I'm wondering if it's still possible to get in before this first semester. She said, you mean on Monday? I was like, yes. She's like, oh no, sorry. We should have sent the rejection letter. You wouldn't be in by now. I said, ma'am, 
It's been my dream my entire life to go to college. I, I, my, my, my education means everything to me, and I specifically want to go to Florida State to learn and grow. And I'm giving this whole sad, sob story, and I've got my hands crossed behind my back, my fingers crossed, because I could care less, but she seemed to be buying it. And then she looks at me for like a hard minute, analyzing me, seeing if I'm telling the truth. And then she leans over her keyboard and pushes A for accept. And I was accepted in to Florida State University. I don't know if you're watching this video right now and you're applauding, but I just want to thank you for applauding my dishonesty. But I left that office that day and I was clicking my heels, not excited by the fact that I'm going to go to the same school that the author Hunter S. Thompson went to or the same school that Pulitzer Prize winning authors went to. I'm going to go to the same school as Norman Thagard, one of the first astronauts in outer space. He went to this school. I'm going to go to the same school as Burt Reynolds. Which, by the way, he did go to Florida State. That's a fun fact for you. No, I was clicking my heels and I was excited by the fact that my mom was no longer going to kill me and hide the body. Right? Like, again, it wasn't about the education. It meant nothing to me. You know, and, and then late, and that was reflected in my whole college experience. I struggled all the way through. I skipped too many classes. I failed too many classes. It was all a challenge for me because nothing motivated me to put in the effort to be really successful, to do more than just get by. But I got to tell you, my senior year of college, I saw somebody was advertising that they needed a tutor for their daughter. And I was an English major because I've always been decent at reading and writing. And so I was getting an English degree just to get through. And, and so I was like, oh, I could be an English tutor. How hard could that be? I need the extra money. They were paying like seven bucks an hour, big bucks. And so I went and I started tutoring this girl. And uh, at first her writing was quite atrocious. It needed a lot of work, but I kept meeting with her every week. And as I was sharing some of the stuff I know and listening to her and working with her at it, I watched her writing start to improve. But as her writing improved, her confidence seemed to grow as well. This girl started carrying herself differently every time. And then when this girl at the end of the semester got the first A of her entire life in English class, she was like a different person. She was confident. She, she believed in herself and her abilities. And I'm kind of shocked. I didn't know this was possible. I didn't know I could share something that I knew and listen and help her grow and would have an effect beyond just her writing ability. And I was like, I need more of this. Like this, this is amazing. It felt like a superpower. And so I met with somebody and I was sharing this with them. And they said, well, you should be a teacher. And I was like, <laughs> why would I ever want to be a teacher? I hate school. And I don't really like teachers either that much. And they're like, yeah, but like this is what good teachers do. And I let that work on me a little bit. And then I started thinking like, well, what if I did this for a career? What if I could do this with more than one student? What if I could do it with 180 students a year? Like, what if you could have this effect on students' confidence and their abilities and skill? What if that is what I did? And this was the birth of this career in education. This was the start of that spark that helped light this big fire that has absolutely fueled me ever since. And it hasn't always been roses in the education world. It's been challenging. It's been hard. I mean, we're at the tail end of a pandemic right now. But I tell you what, there's something about having this purpose that drove me to work like never before. When I got done with my undergraduate, the first thing I did is I went and got a job at a long-term care pharmacy where I spent 40 hours a week packing pills. Why did I do that? Because it paid pretty good. And that was enough for me to go to night school to take do 40 more hours a week to become a teacher. I went and enrolled in a teacher college and I started spending 80 hours a week developing all of this work ethic and gumption and grit that I never had my whole life, but now I was relishing it. Why? Was it because it was easier? No, it was way harder actually, but because there was something driving me. There's something about having purpose that makes us work harder, that makes the slog worth it, that makes those hours and the energy and the sweat and blood and tears worth it when we have a reason to actually work. You know, I've, I've, I've uh, Mike Rowe from the show Dirty Jobs, he's got this great quote. He says, don't follow your passion, but always bring it with you. There's something about we've been told that we're supposed to be passionate about everything we do. 
and that passion is what we should always follow. But you know, like the truth is, there's a lot of parts of life that we're not necessarily passionate about, that don't give us, you know, passion is a feeling and passion is a great feeling and we should feel it as much as we can, but we're not always feeling it. And so when you follow your passion, it can be difficult because there's those times where it runs out or where you're not feeling it and then you're starting to question, why am I doing this work? But instead, when you figure out what your purpose is, what actually lights your fire, what's meaningful to you, what's worth the effort, what's worth the energy, what's worth the blood, sweat, and tears, when we have purpose driving us, that makes you overcome anything that gets in your way. A strong why allows us to withstand any how. There was a lot of hows to becoming a teacher, but they were all worth figuring out because that why was burning bright and that why is still burning bright for me. So my question for you is what is your why? What is your purpose? What is the thing that drives you most? That when you're not feeling the passion, you still know that there's something meaningful worth chasing after. And then I would also ask you, how can you instill that sense of purpose into the people who you are working alongside? Whether you're a school leader, how can you foster that in your educators? Whether you're a teacher, how can you foster that in your students? And if you're a parent, how can you foster that in your own kids? Because there is so much power in knowing purpose, knowing that the work we are doing is meaningful. And that's why I started caring about my education. And that's why I became an educator myself. And that is why I continue to be one. Because there's something about purpose and knowing that we have this ability to help bring confidence and skill and belief to our students that could keep me up at night if I wasn't chasing after it. So anyway, mom, sorry I lied to you. I did get through college though, so please don't hold it against me.